one thing that I wanted to share a little bit about, uh, just kind of about this past year for me, uh, was that last spring I celebrated my 25th anniversary as a priest. Uh, and it's kind of amazing. Thank you. It's, it's, it's uh, quite been a beautiful journey, and I think uh, whenever we hit these milestones, we're always kind of amazed uh, at how long it's been and, and just how quick the time has gone, so it really is beautiful. I think there's a picture of me there uh, as, a, as a young seminarian deacon at the Josephinum. That would have been probably like 1997 or so. Um, and as I've been thinking about, you know, the last 25 years, and in particular being at a seminary, it's given me opportunity to think about uh, how things have changed in these years since, since I went through formation myself. Um, some of you know um, that my um, father passed away about two years ago, uh, and at the end of his life, he struggled with dementia, and that's never uh, a good diagnosis, and it certainly was hard on my mom and family. Uh, but there were some lighter moments, uh, and I remember once visiting my dad at the nursing home on a home visit, and I was explaining to him that it was time for me. There's, there's mom and dad in my ordination there. Uh, and I was explaining to him that, you know, I had to go. I was getting ready to drive back to the seminary, meaning come back here to my assignment. Um, and he just kind of grimaced, and he kind of looked confused. And then he said, well, I thought you did that already. <laughs> Is the bishop sending you back for more? <laughs> now, mind you, I'm running the place, right? But he thinks I failed. So... Um, <laughs> I just kind of smiled and said, well, I think so. You know, it's, it's probably good to, uh, good to receive more formation. And really, I think my dad maybe hit something on the head, which is that all of us, I think, uh, priests uh, at the top of the list, but all of us, I think, are in need of that, of that opportunity for ongoing formation. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. While I was celebrating my 25th anniversary as a priest last spring, the church was celebrating the 30th anniversary of St. John Paul II's uh, landmark letter uh, his instruction on seminary formation. In Latin, it's called pastores daba vobis, or I will give you shepherds. If Actually, at the seminary, if you come into our main doors, you'll see that uh, written above the lintel, right above our doors as you enter the seminary. Um, and this document, I think, really launched what I call the modern age of seminary formation. It really was one of his greatest gifts for the church. So if you do the math, um, that means when I was going to seminary about 30 years ago, uh, this was a brand new document, and so it hadn't really uh, fully been implemented during my time in the seminary. So what were some of those things that were different? Well, for one thing, we used to talk about uh, going to the seminary to study to be a priest. We, we very much viewed it kind of with sort of an academic lens. Uh, you went to seminary, you got a degree in theology, and then you were ordained a priest. Um, when you finished your studies for the priesthood. We don't really talk uh, like that as much anymore today uh, because it was John Paul II who gave voice to, I think, a much broader vision of priestly formation than just academics, though that is certainly an important component. Uh, he was the one who articulated a need for a robust human formation. And in fact, uh, he said that the human formation has to be the foundation uh, that all other formation rests upon. Uh, John Paul gave us the now familiar language of four dimensions of formation, human, spiritual, intellectual, and pastoral. Another way to say that, that we're not just uh, forming our mind in theology, as important as that is, but we're going to form the whole person, form the whole man. And it's really, again, a much broader vision of seminary formation. And since then, we've gone on to really stress how these four different dimensions have to be integrated, back to the little buzzword, uh, Deacon Kyle said earlier, right? Integrated formation is so important to what we do, meaning that each of these dimensions don't stand on their own, but as we grow humanly, as we grow spiritually, that's also going to aid and strengthen our pastoral ability and, and our spiritual life as well. They all kind of go together. And the mission of our seminary then really takes its cue from this language, to provide integrated Catholic formation for those called to serve as priests, deacons, or lay leaders in their local church. And so that sums up the, our work at the St. Paul Seminary. First in that list of those we serve is priests, both current priests and future priests, and that's intentional. Uh, we know that Archbishop Ireland, over 125 years ago, founded a seminary, um, and so priestly formation will always be at the heart of what we do. Um, at the same time, we're also thrilled to have a little bit of a wider mission to take that expertise and form permanent deacons and lay leaders for our church as well. It's really an exciting uh, mission to be able to serve uh, so many people in our work at the seminary. 
To succeed in carrying out this mission, then we need to have, and we are blessed with an incredible faculty, an incredible staff, administrators, a very active and engaged board. I'm grateful so many board members are here this evening. Um, another piece of good news was um, last June, at the end of our fiscal year, we were able to complete successfully uh, what we call the Joyful Catholic Leaders Campaign that we've been speaking about for the last number of years. Uh, here at the seminary at St. Paul uh, Seminary, our goal was $37 million, and we're blessed to actually have exceeded that goal. So uh, kudos to everyone who made that possible. <clears throat> Enrollment remains strong. This fall, we opened our doors to 82 seminarians uh, from 16 different sending dioceses. And included in that number of 16 were two returning dioceses and one new one. So I think that's a great sign of hope and confidence from regional bishops who really are turning to us uh, for their formation needs. And um, I would like to invite maybe all of our seminarians uh, who are here this evening uh, to please stand and be recognized. As I continue to reflect upon what has changed since I was in the seminary, I'd like to share four ways that our approach to formation has changed over these years. One is that we've now shifted to understand uh, priestly formation as something that happens year-round. It's not just limited to an academic calendar. Um, years ago, for example, when I was in the summer, I remember in the summers, kind of having the summers off, and I had to sort of look for uh, pastoral opportunities and sort of kind of uh, figure out what was the best way to use my summers. It wasn't really uh, sort of programmed in for me. Uh, but now, we not only have a robust teaching parish program that Deacon Kyle mentioned, in which a man can get experience in our local parishes for all four years of theology, uh, but also during the summers, uh, we're able to use those as additional uh, times and opportunities for formation, things like ministry to the sick and suffering, intensive uh, Spanish language immersion, a rural ministry experience, or additional time in a parish. And so the summers really have proven to be uh, just as formative, perhaps in different ways, not so much in the classroom, uh, but helping that, that broader formation of the whole person. Second, We've also become, I think, a little more real. Um, I'm not quite trying to say this, but, but more real about the human needs of our seminarians. Uh, we all have them. And, and when I was in seminary, for example, uh, we had on, on staff one part-time counselor um, who no one would ever dare to go see. <laughs> uh, and, or if you did, you, you, you didn't tell anybody about it, right? Um, and now I think we're just so blessed. The culture has changed. We're able to be upfront and honest about the importance um, and that human formation of taking advantage, for example, of good Catholic counselors who can be available uh, to accompany our men for that human growth. Our director of psychological services, Paul Ruff, has helped to shape our human formation program and given our seminarians permission just to be themselves and to acknowledge areas of needed growth. And this happens both in individual meetings as well as in uh, occasional group work. For example, we have a group uh, that supports men dealing with anxiety. And that's a pretty normal challenge these days, pretty garden variety kind of stuff. Um, and, and that group actually doesn't take themselves too seriously. In fact, they've dubbed themselves the 12 anxious men. Um, <laughs> You know, but Mr. Ruff has become so busy uh, that we now have three additional counselors available, each serving one day a week, that our men can seek out. And that's really good stuff when you think about it. It's nothing to be ashamed of or embarrassed. It's really a point of pride. And it just wouldn't have happened 25 years ago. We never would have had those kinds of conversations that we can have today. It really is a blessing for ourselves in the church. A third point might be the intentional encounter that we have with the wider church. Uh, specifically through our January term schedules. It's one of the, the blessings and kind of the rhythm of the academic year here at St. Thomas. When I was in seminary, my class had one travel experience uh, at the end or kind of middle of our fourth year uh, with the rector to Washington, D.C. And we were excited about the trip and it was a great opportunity, kind of a capstone experience. Um, but now we take advantage of that January term to really travel the world, and not just to, as sort of sightseeing, but really to immerse ourselves in the lives of others. Um, our second year men travel to Mexico City to encounter the poor in Arli de Guadalupe. Our third year men go to the Holy Land uh, to deepen our knowledge of the sacred scriptures and to have a preaching practicum, to practice preaching at the holy sites. 
and our fourth-year men go to Rome to experience the universal church. Accompanied by staff priests, the seminarians can enter deeper into relationship with one another and take what is learned in the classroom and then bring that to a whole different place and be able to reflect upon these great truths of the faith and really put them into a practice in a different way. That experience of pilgrimage and of travel allows the men to be formed in a way that isn't possible just in a classroom. And since I've been here, I've been blessed to be able to travel every J term, uh, except for the, the COVID uh, term that we had a couple years back. And, and I've been to all these experiences, to Rome, to the Holy Land, and to Mexico City. And I look forward to returning uh, with Father Coop, our Dean of Men, this coming January in our Theology II class, so once again to Mexico uh, to encounter our poor and Our Lady. And finally, in more recent years, the Church has built on this great vision of formation that was articulated by St. John Paul II. Uh, he emphasized, and really the church has now emphasizing in these days, um, the need to strengthen what I would call sort of the pre-seminary uh, and the post-seminary experience, kind of the two bookends to the great work that we've been doing. On the back end, we have what we call ongoing formation, uh, perhaps uh, the need articulated by my dad those couple of years ago. Uh, we are blessed to have a robust offering of programming through um, our Institute for Ongoing Clergy Formation, headed by Deacon Dan Gannon, and one signature program just wrapped up last week, which is the annual Pastors Workshop, where pastors, whether uh, new pastors or seasoned pastors, can gather together with our team offsite at a retreat center. Uh, along with them is, is lay business leaders who volunteer their time. And they're able to learn some best practices on administration and HR and other things they need to run the parish, uh, some skills on leadership and forming leadership teams to try to give them those practical tools that maybe we can't really do everything during the four years of seminary, but an opportunity for them to receive a deeper formation specifically in that role of serving in leadership as a pastor. Uh, there's a group of lay volunteers, some of you are here this evening, known as the Shepherd Staff, who can provide ongoing coaching uh, to these pastors. And so what a great gift that we can support our pastors in this way and that so many are involved in this, again, just beyond our, our seminary faculty, but especially uh, those business leaders uh, who can really help impart needed skills uh, to those entrusted with leading our faithful. And then on the front end, kind of the, maybe the final piece here and something we'll, we'll share a little more about from our couple of seminarians is what we call the propodeutic stage. That's kind of a big word. It basically means to teach beforehand. And it's something new, um, but it's really proven, I think, to be very important. And, and you might think of it as kind of a pre-seminary, a year set apart in a smaller, distinct community where the men can unplug from distractions uh, where they can really focus on the human and the spiritual aspects of formation. Part of the rationale for this is that there is today a greater gap between what seminary formation entails and the life of a typical young adult. A generation or two ago, the societal and cultural values were more aligned with the church's understanding of the human person, maybe more uh, encouragement of a vocation, uh, maybe more of a, of a deeper formation in the life of the church. But today, oftentimes, the values of the world are at odds with what we understand and believe as Catholics. And the men coming to us are often deeply affected by the world as well. And so last year at this dinner, I announced that we were one of the first seminaries in North America to launch such a program. Ours is housed at the former convent at St. Mark's Parish, just real nearby here. And we've now dubbed that Damascus House a nod to our patron St. Paul and the time of rest that he had and formation in Damascus after his conversion experience. Beginning next fall, this propodeutic stage formation will be a required element for all those uh, entering priestly formation across the United States. And because we were one of the first seminaries to give it a go, Father John Floater, uh, the director of our program, and I have been busy sharing our experience with other seminary formators nationwide. We were in Chicago uh, recently for a conference, and we've been at other uh, seminars where we've been able to kind of share our experience and really, in a sense, um, be a thought leader on the national stage uh, for this program. And it's been a great gift, I think, for us to reflect on what we've done, maybe changes we might make, and to help encourage uh, other seminaries and formators across the country as they themselves embark on this important work. Among the most interesting features of our program is a media fast. And so six days a week, the men turn off their screens and phones 
and do something pretty old school, which is they talk to each other. Um, <laughs> And I think you've been in situations, you know, I've seen this when I was a college chaplain. I would go into, you know, maybe the, uh, the common space in the Newman Center, and all the students are there uh, sitting in groups, but everybody has a phone in front of them, right? Um, and so the beauty of a media fast is it really kind of helps you unplug from all that. It's not a problem at Damascus House, because I think Father Floater takes their phones away, right, and sticks them in a, in a, in a room, and they only get to use them on Saturdays. Uh, but what a great gift, and, and the men can share about that themselves. But it really uh, is, is a beautiful thing to see. I was able to be at their house, a Damascus House, last Saturday evening, um, and uh, they welcomed me for evening prayer and dinner, and uh, sharing of grace is kind of a custom uh, they have there, and we do this in the main seminary as well, where a weekly opportunity for the men on a hall or a floor to share a grace or thanksgiving from the week before. And the level and depth of that, uh, that conversation and sharing was really quite beautiful and moving. One thing I've noticed in getting to know our men is that the path to seminary can be as varied as there are people in this room. And that is what makes what we do so special. Each man can be received as he is with his own unique story, his own unique gifts, his experiences, and his weaknesses, and he can bring all of that, and that becomes sort of the matter for formation. It becomes part of the, the stuff that God works with in forming him to be a priest. In short, a man can become fully himself, fully alive in Christ, and that's what the church needs today. In just a few moments, you will hear from uh, two of our seminarians who last year were part of this uh, propedeutic stage at St. Mark's, Damascus House, Andy Rainier and Joshua French. And so rather uh, than, again, hearing more from me about that, we'll get a chance to hear their stories. But before you hear from them, I just want to wrap up uh, these remarks by expressing my gratitude and thanks to all of you, because you make possible this great work that we do at the St. Paul Seminary. You help us to form our future priests, deacons, and lay leaders. All told, we have around 1,000 souls who come through our doors every year. Uh, the Catechetical Institute is large, ongoing clergy formation, hundreds of people coming and receiving in addition to our seminarians and those in lay degree programs. It's really an amazing gift to ponder uh, what is happening. It really is, um, as Archbishop uh, Flynn used to say, the, the sort of the heart of the local church. And I'm thrilled and honored to be leading a seminary in this time, in this age of the church. Priestly formation is no doubt better than it was 25 years ago, thanks to the insights of St. John Paul II and so many other leaders since. Uh, we are better able to meet the unique challenges of the world today than we would have been just a generation or two ago. And every person in this room, all of you here, are an important part of this success story. And so know that we can't thank you enough for your support and your prayers. But a lot of work still remains to be done. Our hope and our prayer and our invitation tonight is that you will continue to walk with us on this most important journey.